Well, God bless you. We're starting our brand new series on end times. Uh, it's based on the book of Footsteps of the Messiah. It's an excellent book and an excellent work that uh, was done by uh, uh, Dr. Frudenbaum, Arnold Frudenbaum. I really highly recommend it. It's just a wonderful book. Let's start off with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for all the many rich blessings you've given us. Thank you, Father, for giving us this information. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for fulfilling all of these prophecies. And, and thank you so much that we can have the hope in each and every one of us to know that you're going to fulfill all the prophecies to come. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for giving us a heads up with all that's happening around us. And uh, so that we don't have to fear those things, but we fear you the maker of heaven and earth. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' powerful name we do pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 So our first chapter is going to be chapter 1 of the uh, book of Revelation. But before that, I want to just give you a really quick, uh, uh, I guess, overview of the, the charts that, we, that I've given out to the class. Um, these charts basically will g help you track along with all the things in a timeline fashion. I've al I'm, I'm more of a timeline type of person, and that plus the fact that Sheila made me do a timeline. But I'm a, I, I like the idea of a timeline, I really do, because it really does, it lets you know exactly where you're at in time and space. And uh, this really actually goes back all the way to actually time, the times before when all the prophecies were being given about the Messiah to come, all these different things. But then also it really, it, it starts off with Daniel and it starts giving you dates that, that you can actually see the fulfillment of all of these dates starting off here. So as you look at this chart, you'll start seeing a few things that are there. It'll start off basically with uh, uh, these weeks. It's called the, the, the 70 weeks or 490 years. And uh, Daniel, in Daniel uh, chapter 9, uh, verses 24 through 27, they kind of start outlaying a whole idea of how, how God's program is supposed to work out. And so nothing should be, uh, uh, we should not be surprised with anything that's coming down the line. And the people should have known, should have known and paid attention to the writings of Daniel during the time, during this time right here, because the time, exact timing was that was prophesied for the birth of Messiah was given by Daniel several hundred years before. So if they had just been paying attention to hear what the signs were going to be, they would have fully known, Herod would have known, he wouldn't have to ask anybody. He would have known, and the whole, all of Jerusalem and all of Bethlehem would have been excited for the fact that Messiah was coming. But the fact of the matter is they went on with their lives, they didn't see the need for it, and as a result of that, they were, nobody was really expecting it. And it's kind of the same thing that we're, do, what we're doing right now. God has already laid out a whole plan of all the things that's, that are going to happen. And some of those things have happened already. And some things are about to happen or we're in the middle of all the stuff that's happening. And for us to be able to be afraid is to, uh, for us to kind of forget the fact that, that Jesus is on the throne. Amen. When Jesus is on the throne, then everything makes sense. Everything, we understand that God has everything under control. We know exactly how everything is supposed to be. And some of these things that you see here also talked about what, what he talked in, Ma in Matthew chapter 24 and 26 called the Olivet Discourse. In the Olivet Discourse, you have this whole idea of uh, what they, they were asking the, the Messiah, they were asking Jesus, what can you do? Tell us a little bit about what's going to happen in the future so that we'll know what to expect and what to look for. So the Lord says, absolutely. And so what he does, he goes on and he explains to them exactly all the things that are going to happen, just that they're up to speed. And he talks about general occurrences that are going to happen after his, after, uh, his, his ascension. And uh, he uh, uh, it talks about the fact that, that there's going to be also... Uh, revving up of sorrows so to speak and that's the beginning of sorrows is what they call it and in those times all the things that were talked about uh, world war one world war two uh, are talked in that olivet discourse and then also famines and pestilences pestilences i wonder if that would be like a virus i don't know anyway that and earthquakes those were things that were going to be ramping up towards as we get towards the end times 
So we've already seen some of these things happening and we're going to be able to see other things happening as well. And then it basically like if you're at the mall and you want to find out exactly where you're at in relationship to the mall, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is that? What is that thing called? The, what's that? Directory. Thank you so much. The mall directory, it says you are here. And then, and then from there, you can figure out where you want to go. Well, that's where we're at. We're right here. All of these things have happened already. And now we're moving on to the things that have not happened yet and the things that are prophesied that would happen before the tribulation period. So that's how we find out that these things are still ready to happen. And part and, and, and in there, the main thing for us as believers is the rapture. And that is Jesus coming back for us in the clouds and we meet him in the clouds. So we're expecting that. That hasn't happened yet. And we know that that is not what triggers the uh, uh, tribulation period, but it is the signing of the tr peace treaty with the Antichrist and Israel. So we know that's what starts the whole process for the tribulation period. So the good thing about it is God has not appointed us to wrath, but has taken us out prior to that happening. It's called pre-tribulation uh, theology. And then, then, we get, then we'll be getting into the actual seven years, the three and a half years, and then the break, and then the, the, the remaining three and a half years within that seven year period, or what Daniel would call the last week. Every week is seven years, and that would be the last week that he's going. And then we'll go from there, and then we'll talk about the Millennial Kingdom. We'll show you exactly wh where you're going to be housing. You'll be housed as a believer. No, I'm not going to go that. But for $20, Josh and I will tell you exactly the time of the rapture. And no, we're not going to do that either because we don't know. But the bottom line is that we, we s and then we're after that, we're actually talking more about as well as uh, what's going to happen in, uh, in the New Jerusalem. What's going to happen with that and, and, and some of the great storylines that, that, that come even after the thousand year reign of Jesus. So this is the chart that we go by and it just makes a lot more sense to go by that because it's just kind of like you know where we're headed and we, we know where we're going to be. As we take on uh, the book of Revelation, it's not just the book of Revelation, but we'll be dealing with all kinds of prophecies that deal with the end times. We'll, we'll be dealing a lot with uh, Daniel. We'll be dealing with Isaiah. We'll be dealing with uh, uh, Zechariah. There'll be a lot of different places that we'll be looking at. There's a lot of things that happen within this period of time that are already in the Old Testament that have been prophesied that are to happen. So nothing really is, there's not very many things that are new, but I'll show you in a second that there are a few things that will be new in this, in this class or in, at least in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is chapter 1. We start off with chapter 1a. And in this case, we'll be dealing with several things. The revelation of Jesus Christ, angels, conditional blessings, and the Alpha and the Omega. First hand, the first thing I want to talk to is, is the fact that Revelation chapters 1 through 20. Everybody say 1 through 20. Those have 550 references found in the Old Testament. In other words, if you want to find something that you, if you find something in the in book of Revelation, there's a good chance that that has been mentioned once before in the Old Testament. So we're getting, as prophecies came in, as, as Jesus has revealed things, uh, all of these different things have happened. All this information is, uh, people understood that and could go back to an Old Testament prophecy and look at that and say, oh, that's what that is and so forth. So that's, that's pretty much a lot of the references in, in the book of Revelation. They're already known. They've, you just have to know where to find them in the Old Testament. But what's really, what's really special is in the book of Revelation chapters 21 and 22, new information about the eternal order. Nothing in the Bible has ever been revealed prior to that, to, hit, to, to John writing the book of Revelation. So that's pretty amazing. So if you really want to find out brand new information that, that is not found anywhere else in the Bible, you go to chapters 21 and 22, and they will go ahead and tell you the, next, the rest of the story. Who was that gentleman that used to say, and now the rest of the story? Paul Harvey, that's right. So then it's like, you know, God is going like, this is the rest of the story. And it's a great story. If you're a believer, you should be really excited about the book of Revelation. Most cases, 
people that, that you talk about the book of Revelation and all they come up with is, man, that's scary stuff, man. I mean, I, I don't understand it and symbolism and everything. But the bottom line is God always intended for us to know what was going to happen. That is part of the security that God gives every believer so that he's not out there like the rest of the people. It's like inside trading, inside information. <laughs> we know what the numbers are going to be. We know exactly how things are going to happen. And we know that they're going to happen. Why? Because God is faithful in everything he does. Amen? So it's not like, I wonder if he's going to do that. Nope, he's going to do it. He said he would. He is. So chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, the introduction and the benediction. First of all, it starts off with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent it, signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Very simply, all he's basically giving you is a chart. And here's the chart. The chart is God the Father gave this information to God the Son, which then in turn gave it to angels, which then in turn gave it to John, which then in turn went to believers. So that's what you have. That's kind of like the way the, the, the whole system works in that how God is, is giving us this book in this particular uh, fashion. Uh, angels, if you notice, angels are in there. Angels have often been used throughout the Bible for revelations. They reveal and carry out the revelation. The law of Moses was given by angels. Uh, to Daniel, uh, it was given, the, the prophecies were given to Daniel about this. The birth of John uh, it was he appeared to Zacharias at the temple and to, t to tell him that he was going to have a son. Uh, the birth of Jesus uh, with Mary and with Joseph. All this information came by way of, of uh, an angel. In most cases, it came from the head angel. Everybody know his name? His name's Gabriel. Gabriel takes, he's kind of like the messenger guy. He's the messenger angel of all the angels. And so his job is to, to make sure that God tells him, go and do something. He dispatches it and he goes over there. What is the first words usually that Gabriel says? <laughs> do not be afraid. Because <laughs> how, I mean, how many times do you meet up with an angel, right? So, so that's gonna, you're going to be able to see something here in the book of Revelation where God will use angels to do his bidding, to do whatever he wants to do. But get a load of this. Do you think that God would use fallen angels or demons to do his work in the book of Revelation? Or just regular angels, his angels? It's a good question, right? What do you think? Okay, Dad, you want to say, go ahead. Okay, no, you didn't want to say, okay, God. <laughs> Absolutely. He uses fallen angels or demons to do certain things that are based on judgment. In other words, he can bring in an angel. Why? Because he created that angel. He can bring in a seraphim. He can bring a cherubim. He can bring a regular angel in there. It's not a problem. But he can also, he has control over all fallen angels. People think that they're, all, they're only under the control of Satan. But if you're going you're gonna to find out that there's several times throughout the, the judgment period as he's going through the, and the tribulation period that he looses angels, to uh, fallen angels, demonic activity to go out and bring judgment to the people or to the land or, you know, just, just total destruction. He doesn't, God doesn't have to only, do, he has at his resources every possible resource at his fingertips. And if nothing else, it tells you that God is in control. He is in control of every side. He's going to be in control of Satan. In fact, when Satan gets thrown into, uh, into the abyss for a thousand years, it says everybody will marvel at that because it's going to take one angel just to kind of like mo move it along. Here we go. Here and here. It's time for you to go. Go to bed for a thousand years. And... And, and then the marvel is that here's this big, huge being, satanic be being and Satan himself. But 
he has no power. He can only do what God allows him to do. And that's important because if not, you always think that there's all this power that's out there that's going to come and get us or that's going to do this for us in society or against us or this or that. Yeah, they might have some power, but ultimately, ultimately, God is on the throne. Always. The book of Revelation is to show us that. I was, uh, Warren Worsby put out a whole series. It's called the B series, B E. Not, not that B, but the, not the series, the, the B series. The B series, and this particular one was Be Victorious was the name of the one for the book of Revelation. And, and he taught me something really early on in my, as, as a believer because I was kind of afraid of this whole thing with Revelation, but I had to teach it, and I didn't, had no clue. It was my first time, didn't know what to do. So when I looked at it, he says, really simple. If you really want to get through this kind of in a, in a, in a victorious way with, uh, with hope, and, uh, and no fear, here's what you do. He says, keep your eye on the throne. That's it. And I read it, I'm going like, oh, wait a minute. I, I, and so then he goes on to, to explain, he says, keep your eye on the throne. Who's making all the decisions? Where's the judgment coming from? Where is all this catastrophe? From, from whose hand is it coming from? In other words, these things aren't just happening just to happen. They're being directed specifically from the throne. And so that tells me it really doesn't matter if we're in the middle, the middle of a virus. I understand it's a bad thing. It's, it, people are hurting. People are dying. But at the very, at the, at the virus is not on the throne. God is on the throne. We may not understand how things are happening or why things are happening, but nevertheless, we have to understand that he has our best interest in mind and he knows exactly what he's doing. Why? Because he's in control. Now, some people don't like the idea of God being in control because when he makes decisions like allowing a virus to go out there or whatever, then they say, well, why would a loving God possibly do that? But we don't have the mind of God. We don't understand all of what God is doing. And we don't really understand all the intricacies of how God is moving us forward down the line towards the one thing, the culmination, and that is Jesus coming back, his second coming to reign. And then after that, to reign forever in a place called the, the, the New Jerusalem. So because we don't have all that information, because we're not God, it's very difficult sometimes to understand why these things are happening. But just understand Somebody's on the throne. It's not the coronavirus. It's not the social upheaval. It certainly is not the politicians. It's not the world uh, uh, going through hunger or all these things that, that seem to take the top notch in, in, in all the news sources. It has to do with God being on the throne. Amen? One of the things it says about the book of Revelation in, in verse 3 it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So he says there's a blessing. There's an absolute blessing for anyone who reads it, who hears the words of the prophecy, and who keep these things. The word keep there is another word for watch or who is watching those things which are written in it for the time is near. In other words, our job is to be vigilant. We get the word, we hear it, we study it, and then we become watchful. And what happens with that is this. We get a chance to see a total picture of what God is doing in the world. And then after that, we know what God has already said about that. And then we have peace in knowing that he knows exactly what's going on and all of these things have to happen in order for something great to happen, including the tribulation period. So the blessing there is it gives us a piece of, it gives us a sense of, of peace, of security. Now the opposite happens when you're looking at all the destruction that's taking place. That's what brings fear. But when you're looking, keeping your eyes on the throne, then you realize God has a plan, okay? And there's a blessing for that. 
Verse 3 puts an obligation on the fifth person of the progression, the believer, while at the same time giving a promise. The obligation is for the believer to study this book. The promise is one of blessing. This is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing to those who study it. Okay, so each one of us that will go through this and study it, or you've gone through it before, you will get a blessing. It's guaranteed. It's, it's a conditional blessing. God will give you the blessing. There are many blessings of God which are unconditional, and the believer is entitled to them simply by virtue of the fact that he is a believer. However, other blessings of God are conditional, and the blessing of God available to the believer who studies this book is one of them. So if you look at everything, you look at, you look at the different conditions or unconditional promises of God. The unconditional promises of God are those promises that he makes. He keeps and you have nothing to do about it. So some of these things are that Israel will have their land. That's unconditional. They will have their land. Uh, the new covenant is unconditional. Who paid the price for us on the cross? Did we do it ourselves? Did we earn our way? No, that was a job that was done by God, he kept that condition. So it was unconditional. We will get that. All we do is believe. Okay? A conditional belief, a conditional blessing is that if God says, if you will read this book, you will be blessed. You will get a blessing. But a conditional blessing of that is the fact that what do we have to do in order to get the blessing? Read the book. Study the book. So, in this case, God has already told us that he's given us an opportunity to be able to have a blessing. How many of you here are looking forward to getting a blessing from this class? Right, because it's the word of God. Only Joshua put his hand up. Okay, you're going to get blessed, Joshua. Okay, that's a, is it, you're going to get blessed. Yeah, from the last time. You're gonna get more blessings even. Okay, <laughs> we'll share the blessing. Studying prophecy gives one a, one a love and a longing for the return of the Messiah. Those believers who love and look for his return are promised a special crown. Did you know that there was a special crown for those that are looking forward to the return of Jesus? There is an absolute crown for each and every person who's doing that. And the question is, well, how do you know? How, first of all, how do you get to that attitude where you're willing just looking for the Lord? The book of Revelation talks to us about it. Th times are getting closer. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Either that or you're late, you're behind on your payment of your mortgage and, <laughs> and you say, Lord Jesus, <laughs> come before they, they take my house away. Either way. But that's what makes us mindful is the fact that we look around and we say, huh, we're getting closer. Closer to what? For the believer, it's not about him being closer to the end times of the, uh, the book uh, in the tribulation period because we don't go through that. The next thing that, that's coming our way is one of two things. We're going to die and being absent from the body, we will be present with the Lord. Or we all get to go. And then Myra kind of fixes the stuff here as, we, as, we, as we're gone. But the bottom line, <laughs> the bottom line is that there's actually a special, special crown if we're looking forward to the rapture. If, if you don't believe me, I'm going to take you to 2 Timothy 4, chapter 8. Finally, Paul says to Timothy, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only but also what everybody read it to all who have loved his appearing he says this idea of looking forward to jesus looking forward to the rapture is part of a blessing as well and there's a crown that's involved so i guess in heaven there'll be there'll be some of us that that that, you know, we're the spiritual ones, <laughs> I guess. They will, we would have said, oh, you know, you know, Jesse, you get a crown because, you know, you were looking forward to, to, to me coming and there's a special crown. And somebody next to me might say, how, how come I don't get a crown? I says, because you never once expected me to come and get you. 
<laughs> you were too busy with the world <laughs> to think about me. And so that would be kind of like the thing. Probably it's going to happen, might happen the other way around. But the bottom line is that there is a crown for each and every one of us for that. Believers often rob themselves of certain blessings available to them because they fail to take God's conditional aspects seriously. The promise attached to the study of the book of Revelation is one of these conditional blessings. While blessings are available for the study of God's word in general, a unique blessing is available through the study of this particular book. The reason is easy to understand. Since so much of this book is based on the Old Testament, a proper study of it will require a study of the Old Testament as well, resulting in a more comprehensive knowledge of the whole Bible. Not only is the blessing to those who read and hear the words of this book, but also to those who keep the things which are written. The word for keep also means watch. The sense in which it should be taken here. The believer, after reading and listening to what the book of Revelation is teaching, should also be watching for these things to come to pass and to be on the alert for the fulfillment of these things. Now, you have to be real careful. Not everything that comes out in the news is the direct fulfillment that you say, oh, that's what that means there. That's got to be that. Because you can be guessing for a while and, it, and it's not necessarily it. But you can kind of back off a little bit and just see where the world is headed. Start just very simply, you know, the, the, this whole mark of the beast that we're going to be talking about a little bit later, like in about three years, we'll be talking about it when we get there. The mark of the beast is all about the fact that people will not be able to buy or sell without having this mark. And all you have to do is just kind of start looking at some of the information that comes in about chips, about numbers, about how people can get, be tracking other people and so forth. Or better yet, just, just watch the series Person of Interest uh, uh, and, and, and you'll find out that <laughs> that all that stuff was very possible with, the, with, with what's going on. In China, they already know how, how uh, to detect a, a terrorist out of 300 people just based on the way he acts. And they spot him every time uh, within a few hours. They, they, they have him handcuffed. So, and it's based on very similar technology. So just imagine technology ramping up that much more. In Germany, during the Holocaust, they didn't have all this technology, all they did, although they did have IBM helping them out with certain things. But nevertheless, they didn't have anywhere near the technology that we've got. It's not even close. And yet, they were very thorough in finding out who was who and finding and, and tracking down people. So it's going to be really important for us as, we look at, as we're watching these things to look at these things. We talk about the invasion of Russia to Israel and you say well, that's not going to happen but right next door to, is, uh, to, to Israel right now next to the Golan Heights you'll see that right as it borders Syria you find that Russian troops are already there it doesn't mean that they're going to cross over and try to take over Israel it just means that just wait for it something will come around that you'll start seeing things and as you do you should not be fearful one of the things we talked about, there's going to be a blackout that takes place during, during now and, and the tribulation period. And we may be able to see that if the rapture doesn't happen. So say, for instance, we have a massive, oh, thank you. Bro. Say we have a massive blackout, right? And then as a result of that, we find out that uh, um, there we, go. we have a massive blackout. And then as a result of that, you find out that, you know, that was taught. You already knew that was going to happen. And so to you, it brings the peace. Now, everybody else in the neighborhood is going to be going crazy. But there's no, and you could be concerned too as well. But you also have the peace of knowing that, wait a minute. Yeah, this is supposed to happen. And we're okay with that. Okay? If I so much as hear that y'all are screaming like babies out there uh, when there's a blackout, I'm going to be very upset with you. Okay. And we're almost there. Okay. Okay. So our job is to watch. 
so that we'll be ready. The believer, after reading and listening to what the book of Revelation is teaching, should also be watching for these things to come to pass and be on the alert for the fulfillment of these things. The same admonition to watch is giving and given in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. This is Jesus talking, and he says the word watch. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is talking about the rapture. Because we know when he's coming after the tribulation period, but we don't know when he's coming for the rapture. In Matthew 25 it says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. That's how we know that it's the rapture, because we, wouldn't, we don't know that. From there, we go on and we move on to chapter to verse 4. So now he goes on and wants to greet the, the, where the letter is going to. And this is where this book of Revelation, where this, this is where this letter, this epistle is going to. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And in Asia, the Asia that we understand, when we say Asia, we, we kind of think that maybe it's uh, the Orient, but it's not. It's in Asia, it's mostly where uh, uh, Turkey is in that area in here and that that would be it and these are the seven churches but it's kind of curious because uh it says that there's seven churches or these are the book these are the, the seven churches and the word the the number seven is always a number of completion in other words if you mention seven as a grouping you're basically saying that anything that is related to that grouping is involved in what he's about to say to it so this is kind of the reason. The reason I tell you that is because Colossae is also a church, but it's not part of the seven that were talked about. We have Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamum, Smyrna, Ephesus. And you have Colossae, which is in that area. You have Troas, you have Miletus. All these areas could, uh, could have been incorporated in there, but then that would have made it nine and then there's no good significance for that number nine, I guess. So seven then talks about the fact that as he's talking about these churches, he's also basically saying not just these churches, but every church that will come as a result down the line. Because there's a message for each church, and every congregation can actually be like one of these churches. So he's saying it's open-ended, but it, it, it kind of basically says because it's seven, that kind of gives you the intent that it's for everyone. So grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits are who, who are before his throne. Sometimes you wonder if the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the book of Revelation or how often it is, and this is one occasion where he, he actually is. The seven spirits who are before his throne is the Holy Spirit. And, used, and the reason we get that or we understand that in Isaiah 11, it actually talks about uh, what, those, what the Spirit of God is all about. Isaiah 11 is talking about Jesus, but he's going to talk about what the Holy Spirit will do with him. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And those are always traditionally and theologically understood to be the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so he, that's the acknowledgement. So that's where he gets it from. So he goes on and, and, and he mentions it in uh, this one. It says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who was to come, and also from the Holy Spirit, and from the seven spirits are before his throne. So there's, there's where he's in. Verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So he's saying, it says, To him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen? I love it. He goes out and introduces Jesus, and he says, 
this is who he is. This is who we, this is who's asking me to write this. This is who we believe in. It's like a creed. It's like a beautiful prayer. If ever you had a chance, you could turn this one into an absolutely gorgeous prayer talking about how great and mighty and awesome he is. Isn't it amazing? He always, God, throughout the book of Revelation, will always remind us, or in this case, John, he remind us of what he did for us on the cross and how he saved us. So that there is absolutely no question that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he is in the book of Revelation in the future still very much the only way to be able to go. So whatever new fad comes in from here to there, it doesn't really matter. If somebody comes up with another apparition, well, you can have an apparition all you want to, except that that never nullifies the fact that Jesus is still the only one for salvation. Amen? And in the book of Revelation, he makes sure that he annotates that and he says that. So then he goes on, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So now he's talking to his people. Now he just basically is saying, Behold, he is coming. The whole point of the book of Revelation, the whole point of the book of Revelation is to tell us one thing. He's coming back. That's it. That's the main thing. And he's going to come back and it'll be glorious and it'll be a wild and crazy and it's going to be like the Wild West all over again that times a billion. But the bottom line is, this is the reason he's coming. So that every eye will see him. Even those who what? Who are they? The Jewish people. Because they're going to remember. And in fact, it's their remembrance of that, what's happened, what, what happened to, to their Messiah, that will bring Jesus back on the second coming. So it's going to be really important. So he just makes it a point to make sure that he includes them in the process. He says, I am the, and this is now Jesus, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so another great advantage of having the book, of reading the book of Revelation is this. You get to hear about our God, not as the servant that took the beating there at Calvary, not, not as the person that was misunderstood, not as the person that, was, that, that, that had all kinds of opposition. That's done. The servant part of God is done. What we're talking about now is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Where everything that happens from this point on is all about the King. He is the Lion of Judah. He was the Lamb of God. He is now the Lion of Judah. And now he's about to deal with humanity and bring down judgment as well as uh, uh, save his people. So all of these things should all give us a sense that, man, I feel good about this. If you're thinking that the rest of the world out there is coming up with all kinds of weird things about what they think God is or who God is and all these different things, it's so good for you to be right on track and strong and have a great foundation of that you belong to the king and the king belongs to you. He's your God. He is your king. And just like that, if the king says we should do something, we need to be obedient to the king. Amen? And if it says that the king is in charge and if he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, then if a Jehovah's Witness comes and talks to me and tells me, well, no, he's not really God. I'm sorry. I have issues with that because the Word of God says, he says he's God. 
and he's eternal. He was God in the beginning, God in the past, and God in the future. And that's, who, that's what builds our faith as believers, to know that he's way bigger than anything that this world has to offer. Revelation chapter, and St. chapter 1b, then will now move us into an area of what, a little bit about a background about what's happened with John. How did John get to the place where he, where he starts writing this? What was the situation? We're talking about persecution, the island of Patmos, and John's face-to-face -face with Jesus. So let's look at the circumstances that John was facing while he's writing the book of Revelation. He's actually in prison. He's been exiled. He's been exiled to the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos is right over here. It's near the, the it's in the Aegean Sea, and it's right the closest kind of big city that we know is Ephesus, and that's right over here, and it's just right down over here. But that's where they would exile people. Basically, it was a penal colony that they would have for people that the government no longer wanted to have anything to do with. Okay. So at the Isle of Patmos, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? But it's not wasn't quite that good looking. Okay, <laughs> now those condos probably go for like 1.2 million dollars. At the time, it was really bad. Okay, so that's but this was the area. That's that's the actual island of, of Patmos. At the time, also between 86 and 95, I think, or 81 and 95, uh, was the rule of Domitian. Domitian was a very cruel ruler. He really believed that they needed to, everybody needed to go back to the religious gods of the Roman gods and felt that he himself was a god. So he was very upset with any, any other type of worship. He, he, could, he could put up with some, but this whole Christianity business, he really didn't like it at all. Up to this point, they would tolerate Judaism so long as Judaism was uh, 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 going along with, with Rome in a sense and they weren't making a big fuss. But when Domitian comes in, already uh, is, uh, Jerusalem has been wiped out. They've, that was in AD 70. He took office like in 81 or so and he's now at this point in time, this is like in 95, something like that, where he's, uh, uh, he's still in ruling and so forth. It's Domitian that has a, a lot of the, uh, uh, would have a lot of the things going on in the, in the Colosseum and the killing of people and so forth. So he is very anti-religious, but as for sure anti-Christian as, as you can get. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, Vespasian was the ruler, uh, was a general who had started the whole thing in AD 70 there with the destruction. In fact, he, he had started, I think, with in, in Gamla a uh, couple of years before, uh, in 68. So in 70, he was in charge of it. But the Caesar died in Rome, and he was in Israel. And so he, as a general, wanted to make sure that he could go and try to get the emperorship. Uh, so he left his son in charge, which is Titus. Then Ch Titus was in charge. Vespasian then went and became uh, emperor uh, Caesar of Rome. Not this Caesar, but that Caesar. Okay, so then what happened after that is you have, uh, uh, so you then Titus, after he wins the battle and so forth, he becomes famous. When Vespasian dies, then Titus becomes the next emperor. After Titus rules, he was a pretty good ruler as far as Roman rulers are concerned. But after Titus dies, then Domitian is the one that takes over and then decided that he's going to clamp down on any religion that was contrary to him. So what he does is he makes an edict and says, I want John to be exiled to the, uh, to, to the penal colony of Patmos. And from that point on, this is where you have it. So John is there. I don't know how long he's been there, but he's been there. And now he's waiting on uh, talking to the Lord, doing some writings, things like that, you know, encouraging others as best as he can. He's got people in Ephesus that he's writing to and so forth. But so what's happened is that he finally, he, he's, this is where God catches him. He's got all this time <laughs> to write the book of Revelation. And so that's where he's at, and that's the circumstances. So he's under dire situation, but nevertheless, 
God is protecting him there and, and kind of sequestering him so that he can write this book. He could have written it anywhere, but this is where he happened to be. So he starts off and says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, talking about we've all gone through this tribulation, so I've been, I'm a companion and I'm actually writing from Patmos and kingdom, and patience, uh, says, both your, uh, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he says, the reason I was there is because I was talking about Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. So, what you find is that this the uh, the reason he's there is because of his testimony, but something that that you would I I didn't know I didn't understand it, and maybe it's trivial. This is I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and that automatically for people who are uh, believers nowadays, oh that must have been on a Sunday. <laughs> but he's Jewish, <laughs> and and then so a Jewish would say, well no that was on a Saturday, that was on Shabbat. But the wording there is more of on a, on a Lord-like day. That's kind of what it's saying. And it's basically saying it was a day that, it was on that day, that special unique day that the Lord talked to me. So it, that day then is the Lord's day type of thing. So that's just to give you an idea. Because some people will try to start a sect <laughs> specifically on the fact that it said, well, there you go, and not have any clue as to why. So, in fact, I was going to start one next week, but now that I read this, I'm not going to do that anymore. Okay, so he says, so he says, I heard this loud voice, like a huge trumpet behind me that startled me. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And he says, and what you see, I want you to write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So that is his job. His job is to look what you see. So he's about to be given the revelation. He's about to be given all the information. And now as he sees it, he is to write it down. And sometimes it tells, like in Daniel, it says, you know, bottle up this information. Don't give it out. In the case of here, he says, no, I want you to, everything that you see, write it down. Also, something about John that you're going to find out in the book of Revelation, where as he writes it, you're going to find a lot of the, the word like. It's like a valley girl, valley girl talk. Like. It's like, it's like this. <laughs> but really, it's every, everything he's trying to, everything he's looking at, everything he's seeing is so off the top, over the top, that it's just like, uh, okay, it, it, it's like this. <laughs> and it's like this. That's what he's trying to do. So, you know, I, we would be in the same situation. If you see some of the things that we're going to be seeing in the book of Revelation, you're going to figure out, what in the world did that look like? It had a head of a lion or of a leopard, and then it had a tail of a scorpion. And then, you know, and it, God, who knows? And it looked like a kangaroo. I don't know. It just was uh, an amalgamation of all these weird stuff and all the things that it would do. Well, that's kind of why he says it was like, is he's trying to, emphasize what he's looking at he says so then he hears this voice and he says well then i turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned i saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man and he's going like this is it was really awesome so now he's getting this visual of what he you know what he's watching what he's seeing it says, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So now, try to visualize that. Put yourself in John's place. Okay, John knew 
Jesus. He knew Jesus in the flesh. He understood who he was. John got a chance to see him in the transfiguration. So he actually got to see some of the Shekinah of God, the Shekinah that was glowing out of his very, his very skin, out of his garments. But it's like he's saying, okay, the Jesus that walked on water, I know him. The Jesus that performed all those miracles, I know him. The Jesus that touched me and cared for me, I know him. I even know the one that was like bright in the transfiguration. I know him. But who is this guy? Obviously, he knows that it's God and he knows that it's Jesus. But it's a side of him he has never, ever seen. This is the king. This is who we're dealing with. And right off the bat, John wants to give us a give us an update and say, yeah, th this, this is not the same Jesus we talked about. He still will have compassion. He still will have the love. He still will be perfect. And his judgment will be ever the same, absolutely perfect without error. Except that he is coming in a different role altogether. And that is a king. When you start thinking about what this looks like, the garments in white, the sash of gold, the eyes like fire, the hair like white wool. You're talking about intensity that John never saw before. And it starts bringing us into this whole idea that the person on the throne is not the Lamb of God who's just very docile or the servant. But he is now the king. So when Jesus was on the earth, he came as, he, he basically came as a prophet. So he, he ful fulfills three offices within the realm of, uh, of theology. One of them as a prophet, the other one as a, um, hold on, prophet, priest, thank you, bro, and king. So his role as a prophet was when he came onto the earth and to show us and to tell us of who God was and everything else. His role as a priest is what he has today, which is our priest, our high priest, our, our person that we go through. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in there he is basically saying, I am the high priest of your life. And if you want to have access to the Father, it's through me as your high priest. But later, he comes in in the role of king. And then it's a different story altogether. And for people who are trying to make Jesus to be this really kind of like really soft and cuddly type of person and so forth, they go to an extreme because he was a man's man as a servant. And he knew exactly what he wanted and did, and he had power. But that is not what's coming down the line. He's coming as the king of kings. There is no one that's going to come anywhere near him with the intensity that he has. And so the first picture that we get, he's looking at that, and he's going like, what in the world? What am I watching? What am I seeing? And you would think, this is John who, who calls himself the one that, that the one that Jesus loved the most, and now he's like, "What in the what is going on here?" So he says, "So and he says, and, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, "Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives." and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And he goes on, he says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, meaning that every church had an assigned angel to that church. Do we have an assigned angel to our church? Maybe. Probably. I hope he's happy with us. <laughs> okay. And it says, and so, and it says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. But now, the intensity of who God is, we're getting a chance to see the king before the king comes. That's awesome. If anything should bring courage into our hearts, is to view Jesus as the king that's coming. The king that's going to bring judgment, but will make things all right. The king that's going to supply 144,000 Jewish men to go out and bring the greatest revival right in the middle of the, the tribulation period. He is the king that's not going to take anything from anybody. He is the king that is in charge of every angel that was ever made. The good ones as well as the fallen ones. He is the king that is in charge of the earth. He is the king that will bring judgment onto the people by way of the earth. He is the king where he's going to say, by his pronouncement, by his word, the judgment that's going to go out is like nothing we have ever seen or can imagine. We can read about it, but to imagine it is way crazy. What we have now is a virus, and it's a scary virus. But as we go through the book of Revelation, you're going to find out this is just but a small, very, very small picture of what's yet to come. If you don't know Jesus, this should be very scary because you want that king not to be judging you and you don't want to have to go through the tribulation period if that's what you're appointed to. But if you're a believer, that's the winning side. I remember this girl was talking about one time she was giving her testimony and I, I really liked it. It was when, uh, when Dallas was still used to win football games. <laughs> Let me preface it with that. <laughs> she says, I was at a, at a Bible study and stuff. I was on my way home. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. And so I was, it was a big game and so forth. And uh, uh, we were probably playing a team that we, can't, that we can no longer say <laughs> the name of that team anymore. I don't know. I'm not too sure. I think it was Washington. And it was a big game. It was a huge game. And so uh, she wanted, she couldn't wait because it had to do with going into the, into the um, playoffs. And so uh, she says, okay, I'm not going to read anything. I'm not going to read anything. I'm not going to listen to the radio. I'm not going to do anything. I'm leaving here. And, I would, and people would say, hey, do no, don't tell me. I don't, don't talk to me. Nothing like that. I want to be able to see it. And I want to experience it because I taped it. And I just want to just, just sit in front and just experience it one, one play at a time. So she's, she's going on and like that. And everything is fine. And, and uh, sure enough, everybody's, uh, uh, so far she's doing really good and stuff like that. And uh, she stopped at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, um, at a place right before she was getting at home. And then all you hear is, and you're not going to believe it. Dallas wins the game with a last minute field goal. And the crowd is going crazy. And she's like, oh, man. And she, didn't fi she, she forgot that they had a TV on at the store that she was at. She goes, okay, well, I already know. So she goes back home. Well, I already taped it. I might as well watch what happened. So she's all upset and everything, right? So she's watching it. And the first, um, the first uh, part of it, I don't know if it was Danny White or if it was Roger Staubach or it was Troy Aikman. I have no idea. We're going to go to back to the old days. So I'm going to go ahead because <laughs> it was, uh, I can go all the way back to, uh, to what's his name, Don Don Meredith. <laughs> anyway, so she says, "Oh, and Dallas loses 20 yards uh, with that, with the with the, the sack of the of, of the quarterback and stuff like that." And she's looking at it and going, "Like, it's okay, man. It'll be all right. It'll be okay." 
And then the next play, and Dallas fumbles. <laughs> and they recover it, take it all the way to the end zone, and Dallas is losing by, you know, seven points. And she goes, oh, golly, oh, shucks, you know, type of thing. But what's happening with her? Is that if she was watching it full time, like she'd never seen it before, she would have gone like, oh, I can't believe it. What's going on with it? She would have been, you know, probably cussing, even though she's a strong believer, nevertheless. And she'd be like, because Dallas would make you do that. And so then she, and, but she goes on down the line, and, and she sees Dallas gets back in. And, and now it's down to the very last play and stuff like that. It's, the, you know, they're ready to hit, you know, to do the, the extra, I mean, the, to do the field goal and stuff. And she's watching it. But in the back of her mind, she already knows how it all turns out. Guy kicks it, it goes over, and she goes, okay, well, I s at least I saw it. But then she said, wait a minute. This is exactly like the book of Revelation. We already know who won. And so everything that takes place, <laughs> we can take it. Because we know at the end how it all turns out. And that's the way we're to look at this. We know who the king is. We know what the king has done. He hasn't done it yet, but he's already done it in the book of Revelation. So it's like it's done already. And he wins. And guess what? I belong to him. And I win. Every time he goes and he does something, it's like I'm there. Because the bottom line is I'm in heaven with Jesus. And you as a believer are in heaven. All the book of Revelation, we're there with him as he executes judgment. We're on that side. Knowing that a righteous judge knows exactly what to do. That our king is in charge. And now we have to believe that he's on the throne. But there we actually see him on the throne. And this whole book of Revelation is meant to give us that hope. If you want that hope, if you want to be able to be part of that group that says, I read the, la the back of the book and we win. If you want to be part of that winning group, there's only one way to go, and that's through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the king, and he is on the throne. And he can be your high priest right now and usher you into a relationship with God, the Father with him and the Holy Spirit to reside in you. It's really simple. As we look at this illustration, you're going to see that this page talks about that in, the, in chapter 21 of 21. Uh, they calls it the streets of gold. It's a description of what heaven is like. And it's absolutely glorious and beautiful and fantastic. And it's wonderful. And the most beautiful part of this whole thing is that's where Jesus, and the Father, Holy Spirit, that's where they live. It's not that it's fantastic and it's beyond anything that we, we can understand here on this earth, but that it's that we are in the presence of Almighty God. We are in the presence of the King. And the only, the only thing that we have to do here on earth to be able to get there is really simple. All you have to be is be like this clean page, absolutely perfect. It says the clean page represents the perfection we need to be able to get to heaven. That means you cannot sin one time or tell a lie or have a bad thought or anything. Because if you do, that becomes a problem. Because then you can't get into, into heaven to be with God. So I've told you that heaven is a great place. I've told you that you have to be perfect to be able to get in. But the problem is this dark page represents our darkened hearts as a result of sin. It is this condition that all of us as sinners find ourselves. The Bible says that we have all come short of the glory of God. Me, you, everybody that you know of that's alive right now, we're all in trouble. We're, we're all in the same boat. And we were all going to a place called hell right now and then after that to be transferred to a place called the lake of fire for eternity. But you know what? Forget about the darkness. Forget about the screaming that you'll be hearing. Forget about the, the, the fire that you'll be feeling. It's going to be the loneliness 
and the separation from God for eternity. Now, God doesn't want you to perish. God wants you to have eternal life. God wants you to be with him in heaven. The red page represents the shed blood of Jesus. The Bible gives us the answer to our problem. Jesus is the answer to our problem. He died on the cross for you and for me. In John 3.16, it says, For God the Father loved the world, us, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever, that means you, me, anyone, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Should not perish, should not have to go to the lake of fire, but instead have a place in heaven. The Bible says for a believer to be absent from the body, in other words, when a, when a believer dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In a simple prayer, just go before God and ask Jesus to come into your life. Just pray, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I can't do it on my own. I realize now that you are the only way for my salvation. You said you are the way, the truth, and the life, and I can't get to heaven unless I go through you. I can't get to the Father unless I go through you. I now realize that I've been, I've been trying to do all kinds of things. I've been going through other people to try to get to, to heaven. I've been thinking about, uh, compared to Hitler, I'm not such a bad person. But the bottom line is I realize that I don't have to be perfect, and I'm not. And I don't want to perish. Dear Jesus, I believe that you went to the cross for my sins. I believe that you, rose, that you were buried and that you rose again on the third day to prove indeed that you are God. I want you to be my high priest and my king. I give my life to you now. If you've done that, and you really mean it with all of your heart, God knows this is between you and the Lord. But if you've done that, you are now part of the family of God. When you read the book of Revelation, keep your eye on the throne because that's your king that's representing you. And you're in that role behind him as you see all the things that the king will be doing in that later date. If we're here and we're believers, and sometimes we look at this world that's around us and it just kind of throws us off. It's just like, you know, what in the world is happening and stuff? Like somebody said, what in the world is, wh 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 where, where is this world coming to? And the answer is an end. And we're moving towards that. It may be a while before we get there, but the bottom line is we're going to see these things that we're going to be talking about throughout this whole series. But you're not to be afraid. You're to be able to get courage, not from me, but from your king. Your king wants to make sure that you get the blessing of feeling secure in belonging to him. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Praise be the king. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' powerful name we do pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.